Good morning, everyone. I am coming at you from the floor of my bedroom. At the time of filming this, my kids are on spring break. They are in the kitchen making their four millionth meal of the day, clanging around. The dog is barking. Excuse any noises you hear. So here I am. I didn't really fix my hair. I've got my classy gray sweatshirt on, not a very fancy background. Let's just say I am having a day. You ever just have a day? I should say I've been having a lot of days like this lately. Some days I'm overcome with hope and I feel really optimistic. And then there's other days when I am just overcome with heaviness. I've talked about this before and it's been an ongoing lesson for me these past couple of weeks, especially though I've been feeling a lot of tension and living in the both and. You know that feeling of holding both heaviness and hope at the same time. There's still so much heaviness in our country around social justice. And you know, we're still battling COVID. And there's a lot of loneliness a lot of us are still experiencing right now. But also, there's hope. There was some accountability for the murder of George Floyd this week. Anyone 16 and over who wants one can get a vaccine in Vermont right now. And warm weather is going to make it possible to be together again and to spend time with people. And so I've just been holding that space of heaviness and hope just existing together. It's all true at the same time. And I just imagined that I'm not the only one feeling this way. And when I can't find the words to pray on days like this, I usually just pray the Lord's Prayer. Sometimes I even just utter the words on earth as it is in heaven over and over again. So I thought before we jump into the service, let's just pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In his hands is the life of every creature and the breath of every human being. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it.
The sound of symphony in my eyes It's like holy water on my skin It's like holy water on my skin How about some announcements? May is going to kick off a very full season of connection opportunities, and we are so excited about all of them. All of the events coming up require registration, which is why I want to be sure you know where to go, how to find the links, and all the details. So, how can you stay connected? Be sure to sign up for our emails, read them on Wednesdays, follow us on social media, bookmark our website, download the Church Center app, and find us by searching Church at the Well which is the easiest way to register for events and also, by the way, to give joyously and generously. There's a lot of ways to stay in the know, so just pick one or two, or if you really want to make the day of this church administrator, look at all of them. Just let those updates wash over you. You won't miss anything that way. As you saw in the video before, May will start strong with Green Up Day which will not only give us a chance to connect, but also to serve, which is exciting. So that's coming up, please register. Then we've got two Sundays, May 2nd and 9th, where we'll be gathering in backyards for church. We will have three locations for you to choose from each Sunday, and two of those are going to have kids church each week. Each location does have a capacity limit, so I encourage you to register ASAP. We will also be here online each of those Sundays as well, so anyone who is not able to attend in person can still join us here online. There's also a call for submissions for the pop-up literary magazine that Abby's organizing. All of those details are on our website and in the emails. And also on May 9th, Abby's hosting a writing workshop where we'll be exploring through writing how God uses little things in big ways in our lives and in the world around us. You don't have to be a quote unquote writer to attend. This is open to everyone who wants to connect with God and each other in a new and creative way. So check out the details for that event. Sign up soon. There's going to be a lot more coming up. Everything I just told you about is all happening in just the first couple of weeks of May. There's so much more we're working on, including more Sunday outdoor church gatherings, a virtual pilgrimage hosted by our ministry partner in diversity. We have a hike planned. So stay tuned for all those details to come. Now I'm excited to introduce this week's guest speaker who holds a very special place in our hearts. Kevin Fitton is joining us this morning. I will pause for applause. For those of you who are new, Kevin was a pastor here for several years, and he and his family have since moved to Michigan. And we really miss them all very dearly, and so we're excited to have Kevin share with us this morning. So without further ado, here's Kevin. Hello and good morning. My name's Kevin. Um, I am really glad to be with you this morning. I actually used to be one of the pastors at Church at the Well. Um, my wife and I and our kids were in the area for about 11 years uh, before Adam ran us out of town and took over the church. So um, a lot of people called that the good season or the great season, that, that period of time before Adam kind of took over. And, and you should probably let him know what you think about the negative changes that he has made to the church. So, okay, some of that wasn't true, but I am really glad to be with you. And I am gonna kick off uh, the sermon actually with a song today. I'm gonna sing 
This song is called The Love of God. It's an old hymn written in 1917 by Frederick Lehman. So you're, you're welcome to sing along with me. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care. God gave his son to win his erring child. He reconciled and pardoned from his sin. Oh, love of God. How rich and pure, how measureless and strong It shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song Could we within the oceans fill and were the skies With parchment made were every star on earth a quill and every man Scribed by trade to write the love of God above would drain the oceans dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. So in church, we sing a lot of songs. I know you sing, still sing songs at Church at the Well, and we don't always pay attention to the lyrics. I know that I don't. Um, I happily sing along to songs um, which I maybe don't even fully agree with. <laughs> some of the lyrics, there are some songs out there, and including some old hymns with some bad theology. Uh, but there's also some great hymns, and, and this is an example of one of those where uh, the lyrics are really powerful. Uh, Frederick Lehman wrote this song not only uh, with a great piece of theology, but also with his heart and his life story kind of wrapped up in this, the, having journeyed through the ups and downs of life and brought both the things that he believed and also um, his experience and his emotions into this song. Some of you know that I'm a writer. Uh, that after working as a pastor for 10 years, I decided to focus my career on, on writing. And so it wouldn't be a surprise to know that I love some of the imagery in this song. There are some great descriptions. I, this, especially I'm drawn to this description of, of all these human beings getting together and trying to take all of our creative energy and using that to try to describe God's love. It's, it, he talks about the idea of the, the ocean being filled with ink, the sky, one giant, massive piece of parchment. And, and despite all of our creative energy, human beings trying to put uh, the love of God, the fullness of God into words and running out of ink. I love that description. It's sort of like a crazy dream that a, a theologian and a writer would have about the world. I also think Frederick Lehman in this hymn has something really profound and important to say to us about God and about our relationship with God. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important piece of wisdom. And what he basically says here is that God is too vast. God is too great. God's love is just too incomprehensible for us to fully understand. And the Bible agrees with Frederick Lehman about this, about the fact that God, the creator of the universe, is beyond our comprehension. You know, when you look at your Bible and, and first open it up, the first book is the book of Genesis. But most scholars believe that the oldest book in the Bible, uh, the one that was written first, is actually the book of Job, which was written between 2,500 and 3,000 years ago. And in the book of Job, God, in a speech to Job, makes this point that, that he is simply beyond Job's understanding. This is in Job chapter 38. Then the Lord answered Job out of the storm. He said, Who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I, will, I shall question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On where, what were its footings set, or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together 
and all the angels shouted for joy. Were you there, Job? <laughs> Do you understand what that was like? Of course not. There's a, there's a huge limitation there for us as human beings in terms of our ability to understand God. And, and of course, we, ex we experience that also as we encounter God's creation. There are aspects of this universe that are simply impossible for us to even start to wrap our minds around. Think about how small some things can be. The atom, uh, scientists tell us that the atom is about 100 pictometers wide. Well, it's a hundred of something. It, it couldn't be that small, right? Well, it is. <laughs> it is. It takes about a million atoms stacked on top of one another to equal the width of a single human hair. Try to, to just even understand how small that is. Also, speed. Uh, we know that light travels at the speed of light. Um, and we say that casually, but this is something that we can't even understand how fast that is. Light travels at about 300,000 kilometers per hour. Okay, that sounds big. Well, what is that? Well, a ray of light traveling around the circumference of the Earth can travel around the Earth more than seven times in a single second. Just try for a moment to think about how fast that is. And we take a really fast jet, <laughs> not gonna get very far in a single second, right? Now let's think about the, the scope of the universe, how massive it is, even just the part of the universe that we are able to experience and see through our telescopes. The Hubble telescope in outer space, uh, if it zooms way out, and takes a picture of the sky, just super far into the distance, we're able to look at that picture and see that it has recorded in that frame 10,000 galaxies. And inside each galaxy is around 100,000 stars. So here's a way of thinking about that. If you look up into the sky and imagine a, a spot in the sky that's about the size of a speck or a grain of sand. Inside that grain of sand, there's 10,000 galaxies. Of course, the world is, is just beyond our comprehension. God, the creator of the world, is beyond our comprehension. In his song, The Love of God, Frederick Lehman says that the love of God reaches up to the highest star. It, not, of course, having any idea that in over a hundred years we would know that the highest star or the highest star that we're able to measure is 83 billion light years away. Now, when we start to think about how massive God's creation is and how vast it is and how powerful the creator must therefore be, it can be pretty easy to start to think that God must be simply unknowable. But there's another side to this coin, to this reality of God's power. And it's this, if God is so powerful that he could create this entire universe, which we live in and we can't even comprehend, if he wanted to make aspects of his nature known to us, this all-powerful God should be able to do that as well, right? And, and the Bible does agree with this idea that we can, be, uh, we can also know some things about God. In the book of Colossians, the Apostle Paul is talking about Jesus and how Jesus reveals God to us, and he says this. He says, The Son, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. This is a very dense passage, and I'm not going to try to explain all of it uh, or get fully into it, but I want to rest on one idea here. Uh, Paul says he calls Jesus the image of the invisible God. And again, later he says that God is both visible and invisible. What he's embracing here is this idea that there is a dual reality about God. 
that God is in some ways knowable. He is made visible to us in some ways. And in other ways, God is invisible, unknowable. Both of these things are true at the same time. What we tend to do as human beings is gravitate towards one pole or the other. There are a lot of people who who look at the Bible and what the Bible says about God's revelation through Jesus and say, well, then we can know God, right? <laughs> and they just fully embrace the idea that we have knowledge of God, that, we can, that there are things that we can understand about God and, and sort of zoom way over to this one side and, and nestle into this idea that, that we know about God. We have understanding. Ignoring uh, the fact that there are things that, that we simply also don't know and can't understand. And then there are people who are on the other side who say, well, you know, there's nothing that we can know. The reality, of course, is, is that we live in this tension. There are things that we just are never going to understand about the Creator. There's no depth. There are depths <laughs> to God's character. There is a, a, a full truth about God that's unknowable. But at the same time, there are parts of God that we can know. There are deep and abiding truths about God's character that we can understand. And the Bible even says that we can know God experientially, that that it's sort of possible for us, even as these tiny, infinitesimal creatures in relationship with God, that we can actually be with God. When I first introduced the hymn, The Love of God by Frederick Lehman, I said that I thought that this was a hymn Oh, and the words of this hymn had wisdom to offer us. Wisdom is when we take a piece of knowledge and we apply that knowledge to our lives. So in this case, we're talking about this idea that God transcends human knowledge, that God is is too high above us to be fully understood by human beings. And so wisdom is, it says, what would we do with that truth? Well, there's a couple of important things I think that we should do with this truth and in applying this to our lives. The first one is simply that we should have humility in our own beliefs about God. We're all in the same boat as human beings, um, looking at a God who is beyond our understanding and trying to do our best to understand what we can understand about who God is. And it's, it's really just best for our spiritual health, for our emotional health as human beings, that we can have humility about what we believe. Uh, It's good to hold on to what we believe and to have confidence in that, but we should also be humble, especially as we approach people who have, who hold on to a different version maybe of Christianity than we do or a different faith altogether. Understanding that what we know is something that we know and that we believe through faith. (laughs) We don't have any clear and direct evidence um, about the revelations that we have embraced. These are things that we believe. And and it's great to have faith. It's great to have belief. But we need to also keep that in its proper context and, and have humility as we approach other people. It's also, I think, a great piece of wisdom for us to be very, very wary of churches and religious leaders who claim to have all the answers. Um, I wish that I had maybe had the words for this earlier in my life, Um, but this is, I just think, a really important thing. There are unfortunately too many churches out there and way too many pastors and leaders who believe that they really have all the answers and they'll take that certainty that they have and they'll use it to to put other churches down and to put other people down and and to criticize them. Um, And unfortunately, these types of people can be really, really appealing because, of course, we're attracted to people who have a lot of certainty, who have a a really, really strong sense of of belief in in God and in in, in certainty in what they believe in pursuing God. And so a lot of times people really rally around these types of religious leaders. But unfortunately, they lack humility in their faith. They tend to discount the beliefs and the opinions of others. They tend to become really controlling. Uh, Sometimes these types of churches will become cults, and, and it's not unusual at all for them to become really abusive and harmful places. And and unfortunately, they all are. They are all around. They're in um, Vermont. They're in the Burlington area. 
I don't think that this is true of Church at the Well. I think Church at the Well is a, is a place that has really humble leadership, and that's a part of what makes it a good, safe place to worship God. I think it's one of the reasons that actually a lot of people have been attracted to Church at the Well, because they've seen that there is a sense of humility. And, and just as total certainty can be attractive for some, I think um, seeing that humility in your leaders is attractive to others. When we moved to Michigan from Vermont as a family, one, that was one of the things that we were clearly looking for was a church where we saw humility in its leadership. And we found that a church called Sycamore Creek Church in Lansing, and now we're a part of a community that's, that's kind of uh, connected to Sycamore Creek in Lansing in Potterville, Michigan. The first week that we went and attended that church, uh, it wasn't the lead pastor who was speaking, it was someone else. Uh, was like a, a staff volunteer and that was to us a sign of humility right that the person who's in charge is letting someone else be the one to stand up front and speak and have the attention placed on them and we continue to see that humility in other ways i just encourage you to always look for that if you're moving if for some reason you need to find a different church Always be on the lookout for leaders who are, who are humble and always be very, very wary of people who claim to have all the answers. And here's another piece of wisdom that comes from this truth about God, that, that God ultimately transcends our understanding. And it's that if we want to know God, if we want to experience God, our posture needs to be as people who are, are ardently seeking after God. And this really makes sense if you think about it, right? We've talked so much in this sermon today about how great God is, about how vast and incomprehensible God's creation is, how impossible that can sometimes be to wrap our minds around. Well, if we want to know a God like that, it would make sense that then it would be a challenge to do that, that it would be maybe not always that easy for us to connect with God, to gain understanding about God, and to experience God. It, it isn't always the case that we find God in, in the places that you would normally look or would expect to look. Uh, I have a master's degree in New Testament studies, so during my my time at Gordon-Conwell Seminary, I learned a lot of Greek and I spent a lot of time studying the New Testament in its original language. And there were most certainly times when that was just amazing, when I felt, just had this profound experience of, of feeling as if I was just getting to know God so much better through that time of learning. And there are times when I've been to worship services and I've just felt so connected to God. Um, it, being surrounded by people who are worshiping God and who are there to have that same experience of connection that I was looking for. But I've also had times when neither of those places really helped me to feel any closer to God. There have been plenty of times when I've opened up the Bible and I've read things and it just, I'm not connecting. When I just feel like I've heard that story before and this isn't adding anything to my sense of knowledge or understanding. Or when I've been to worship services and it feels like people around me are connecting with God, but it just isn't happening to me. Sometimes we experience God in, in these sort of obvious places. Sometimes we find God in other places. It just feels as if uh, maybe sometimes we have to look a little bit harder. Sometimes we find God in the woods. Sometimes we find God in the mountains. Sometimes we find God and experience God in relationships with other people uh, who are also a part of God's creation, right? Some, the most amazing part of God's creation is, are, are, the, are his children. One of the things that I miss the most from the time uh, during this pandemic is, is having like just long dinners with friends. Uh, this is something that my wife Rebecca and I really have always loved to do is just when you're with really close friends and you're able to just have this long, long, <laughs> slow dinner where you spend lots and lots of time together. And those can be times where I really feel uh, deeply connected to God. Sometimes we experience God in places that you'd never think to look. Um, in, in books and in stories that were written by people who don't even believe in God. And yet I've found at times where I've just felt profound sense of connection through God um, in that. I felt God in, and in Zoom meetings and <laughs> staff meetings. There have been times where I've experienced something that has really helped me to connect with God. The biggest thing is just for us to realize and hopefully embrace the fact that God is 
is truly great. God is truly difficult for us to comprehend. And yet the Bible says this and insists this, God, the God of the universe wants to spend time with us, wants to experience our presence and is open to um, sharing his presence with us. That's a pretty remarkable thing. Um, and it's, a, it's an amazing invitation. But I know through my own life experience, I know as I've worked with others uh, through their own spiritual growth, this kind of thing doesn't come easily, this type of experience. Knowing God, understanding more about God, experiencing God, it only happens when we seek Him, when we are truly devoted in our lives to knowing God, uh, learning about Him and experiencing God's presence. It comes to those who seek.